David come. Please, yeah, welcome him. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you in advance for your word. Father, I pray that it would find good soil. God, that we would hear what it is you're saying to us individually. But Father, that we'd also hear what it is you're saying to us corporately as a community of faith. So Father, take a hold of Dave's words, God. I pray clarity. And Lord, um, let let us just hear your heartbeat this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. So great to be with you this morning, and uh, my message this morning is between two kingdoms, Um, and of course those kingdoms that I refer to are the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. Uh, I'm particularly interested to explore the connection, uh, the connection that God has uh, bridged between those two kingdoms to facilitate his kingdom goodness to us on earth here. Um, I'm not sure whether many of you have tried to read through the whole Bible, I have tried many times. I start in Genesis, as you do, but I rarely get out of Genesis. It is such a mind-blowing book. I just get so just buzzed by the revelation that comes, um, and I just spend my whole life in Genesis. It's so incredible. And this morning, we might not even get out of Genesis 1.1. We're going to look at Genesis 1.1 this morning, and I think you're going to see that this word in Genesis is so full that it's just incredible. So Genesis 1.1, if we could change the slide. In the beginning, God. And so I've broken that one verse into two parts. And the first part is in the beginning, God. Now, the second part is he creates the heaven and the earth. So what we need to understand, right, straight away, is that there is no environment. There is nothing. There is just God. God is so powerful. He is, he is more powerful and intelligent than Jackie. He is smarter than Alan. Uh, he is, funny, is funnier than Alan. Uh, he is overflowing in everything that he needs. He needs nothing. He is self-sufficient and he is abounding in everything that you could imagine. He needs no environment. He needs no structure. He creates structures purely for us. And so uh, straight away, this makes me ask some questions. What was the motivation with which God would create humanity? And all I can assume, and I challenge you to think about this and to come up with another conclusion, the only conclusion I can come to is that God is so utterly motivated by generosity that he wanted to give everything that he had away to billions of children. When you are limitless in every good thing, you are not threatened, you are not prone to greed, God is not restricted in any way, and his motivation is abounding generosity. So when you understand this concept, your emotional, physical, psychological position towards God should be reaching up in expectancy and hope. It engenders hope. If God was an angry God, we cower away. If he wanted to use us as slaves, some kind of weird slaves, you would cower away. But God doesn't need slaves. He needs nothing. He needs nothing from us. He, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are so content and fulfilled in their fun, their joy. Every good thing is with them. And so the only conclusion we can possibly have is his whole intention His whole intention from the beginning of time until now and into the future in all time is to give all of the goodness and the blessing of the kingdom qualities he has to us humans. Now, it's hard for our mind to to grasp that because we live with selfish, limited human beings. But I challenge you to think of any other motivation except that. And then I ask you, what should your response be except to all day, every day, be posturing ourselves in expectation to receive his overflowing goodness, because that is his intent. So now, let's get to the second part of verse 1, where God uh, amazingly creates heaven, and he chooses in his massive uh, immeasurableness to put himself in an environment for the first time. It's a pretty good environment. The Bible doesn't tell us how heaven was created. We do have descriptions in Revelation and other places that describes how beautiful it is. 
golden and just every gem you can imagine. It is beautiful. But of course, we know it is not the environment, it's who is in that environment that really matters. And so our desire to go to heaven ultimately is not to just to be in this place that is just gold and jewels and beautiful, but it is to be with God because he's the source of all goodness. And that is the joy and privilege that many of us have today uh, when we pass away. And so uh, we just told very quickly that he creates the heavens, and then my assumption is he chooses to humble himself and to put himself in the heavens. Now, the heavens are pretty big, but when you know how big God is, he has limited himself and put himself in that place. Now he starts to uh, focus himself on creating a place and environment for us, to put us in. And so the Bible goes to great detail about how he creates the world. Uh, it's just amazing to just to read and be uh, amazed at, at the process and, and the detail that goes into the creating of this beautiful world called Earth. And so we read with a, that eventually Adam and Eve are created. They're put in this beautiful place. And what we see is some mysterious connection between the two worlds. God's intent was there to be one kingdom, two worlds... And his abundant goodness would just generously and extravagantly flow into this world called earth. And we saw that that was his promise, that was his intent, and that's what happened. We read, and you just start to use your imagination, that Adam and Eve are in this beautiful world, physical world, but they are also receiving this kingdom refreshment and life and goodness and abundance. And there is an open heaven. There's an open heaven because there's one kingdom. And God is even coming and dwelling with them. God is walking with them. And they have open access to, to, to God, the Father in heaven. And there's this incredible connection that we can't even gra grasp in our own mind. But there is a pathway, a connection between the two. And of course, we know this story. And we have only part of the story that Adam and Eve ate an apple. Now, I don't want to be inappropriate here. Sometimes I wonder whether there's more. Uh, but it seemed like Adam and Eve emphatically decided we want our own kingdom. We wanted to be the kings of our kingdom. We want to live our own way. And of course, we just read that they had an apple. And that sounds pretty harsh that just one bite of an apple caused such a cataclysmic separation of uh, God's kingdom from the earth, which is what happened at that place. But I think that really what was happening is Adam and Eve said, we want our own kingdom. We want to rule it our own way, and we want to just satisfy ourselves with the beauty of this physical earth that has been given to us. Now, we see very quickly how God responded. In Genesis 3, we see this angel immediately that is put uh, in this gateway, this kind of gateway in this connection point. We know it's in Eden, but I think it represents that connecting point between he uh, the kingdom of God and earth. And God says, now, you want your kingdom? I honor that. God is not a controlling, uh, abusive God. He allows them their own way. He wants us to choose him as our king. He doesn't want to dominate over us. So he gives man their way. And we see this gate of types that's closed. This flaming sword very clearly shows this very intimidating, emphatic sword passing in every direction. There is no longer any access between the two. You know what we see very quickly? Adam and Eve's son is involved in murder. And he's defiant about it. His grandson now is, uh, commits murder and he is arrogant about it. And we see the further away that separation from God with man, the escalation of perversion and wickedness that happens such that in probably five generations, the whole earth is so riddled with uh, offense and wickedness and perversion that God can no longer allow it to exist and we see this particular name of this individual pop up, and his name is Noah. And we understand what needs to take place. God, from the minute he established this whole connection between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of earth, and Adam and Eve sinning in this blockage, God has been setting about 
a process of trying to re-establish this open heaven for humans to have once again. That has always been intent for us. He knows that without that connection, without him, we will uh, escalate into perversion and self-destruction radically. And we are seeing a radical escalation of it now because the more we reject God, the more radical the escalation of torment and, per- and perversion humans enter into. So God's intent has always been to try to recreate and get us back to that place of having an open heaven uh, between him because that's where life and wholeness and beauty and goodness come. And so he has this challenge and he's about trying to sort this out. So what we see is God essentially starts again. And there's one man that he chooses, and his name is Noah. There's a lot of good things we can say about Noah, but there's a particular word that starts to come up about this particular time, if you change the slide, and that is faith. When you read in Hebrews in particular, the word that is used to describe Noah is faith. This really interesting word faith about this time starts to pop up. And really what I want to uh, get across this morning is I want to demystify this word faith. We, we kind of think it's this mystical word where if I shake my head enough times I can have faith or if I put my antenna up I can get it or whatever it is or I get the wind in the right direction. We have this mystical sense about faith. But I want to demystify it today. I want to explain how practical it is. Really what faith is, is actually believing God's promises. When God says something, we believe it. If we believe it, that's all he wants from us. Now, it seems so complicated, but it's actually ridiculously, ludicrously simple. God promises. He's abounding in his generosity, and he's just releasing promises to humanity all the time. All he wants us to do is actually agree with him and believe him and actually receive those goodness from him. And Noah was a man that could do that. And so God promised a new world, a new world. And Noah had that open God experience, maybe not the same as Adam and Eve, but why did he have that? Because he had this dimension of faith where God would say something and he would say, I totally believe you, God, and I will obey you. And we know the example that he had to work with, uh, the pressure of society all around him, and yet he is building an ark, which was not a slow, uh, fast process, uh, where there was no rain at all. And so Noah not only believed God in faith, but he obeyed him against incredible adversity. And, And it was his faith that allowed him to have that open connection with God and access to the resources of the kingdom of heaven. And so, for me, faith is like a key. When I talk about this gate that was shut, those fiery sword seemed to shut a gate of connection between access of the goodness of God and earth. And it seems like faith is a kind of key that we are no longer allowed to access heaven because of our sin and our wickedness. But faith gives us a key, once again, to an open heaven where we can actually draw down the promises of God into our life. And so let's have a look at Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verse 1. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. As I said, we reach up to God in hope. Without God, the further we are, the more hopeless and radical our perversion, our escalation into perversion happens is humanity. Our hope is for the goodness of God. And God says, as we hope in him, faith is the substance of those things that you hope for. Now, the, the Greek word for substance is hypostasis, which in English we use that word as title deed. So here's an example. Someone comes to Jackie and says, there is a house that I'm giving to you, and it's in Gundawindi. You can't see it, but I'm telling you it exists. Jackie can't see it. She doesn't know if it's a scam. And then this person shows up with a title deed, with the, oh, the New South Wales, the New South Wales government stamp, which has got absolute authority over title rights of land in this state. And there's a signature on it. And this title deed is given to Jackie. 
Now, she has the substance of assurance to know this house is real. Not only that, but this promised house now belongs to her. That title deed now is the key for her to walk in and take legal and absolute possession of that house. That's how faith works. Faith is a title deed that God gives you that when you believe his promises, you can take that like a title deed and walk into that promise and bring it down into reality right here and now. This is how faith is like a key, a legal key that the owner of a house has to open and to receive promises. So faith is a key that God graciously gives us to access his promises to us. I'm going to talk about three categories of promises that uh, I can think of. Uh, And so the first one is the promises that are available from God to the natural world. This is all human beings, Christians and non-Christians alike. This beautiful natural world and the promises that are in it. So I'm going to refer to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 17. I hope you can read it on the screen. Um, So it says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything. So there's the answer to this this interesting, mysterious bridge of connection. It is Christ. He is the way. It's hard for us to understand, but God does not do anything except through Christ. He speaks a word, and Christ becomes the manifestation of bringing that promise into the natural world. And so Christ facilitates all things. For through him, uh, God created everything in the heavenly realms. So heaven was created in this way, and also on earth. He made the things we can see, but here's a really interesting one. He also made the things that we can't see. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Uh, And right down the bottom, it scrolls down and he says, He holds all things together. He is constantly holding all these things. So as he created creation right now, it wasn't just, Hey, uh, I create the world and now I'm just going to go back to heaven and I'm going to kick around up there. No. Christ is so unfathomable that right now, everything that's created in the natural world, he is holding it together. He's holding it together right now. He is here with us. Christ is holding the universe together. Now, what I find really um, incredible about this is that um, we look at the physical things in this world and we see a chair. But I think as the scripture talks about the unseen things, I believe that nothing exists without the unseen things. So if you don't have the law, the unseen law that Jesus created called um, atomic bonding or or, um, what do you call it, uh, Adam's um, molecular bonding is a law that holds molecules together. And it's all of these invisible molecules that come together to create a physical object. And so nothing physical can exist without these laws. So let's have a think about these natural laws. We think about air pressure. I contract my muscles and air pressure sucks air into my body. I eat something and this law of osmosis happens and it digests and chemical reactions happen. They're all laws of the natural world. When we build this building, it doesn't matter how smart you are, but you have this little bubble that tells you where vertical is, and you obey that law, and you can build wonderful things. So everything physical on the earth is dependent upon us obeying God's natural laws so that the promise of his beauty can actually exist. So let me play this out and how faith works, because what I want to tell you that ironically... Even people that don't know God are actually living by faith every second of every day. So I was sitting in an airplane in Ethiopia. It's probably one of the first things that I did when I started YWAM. I always felt like I wanted to start a mission center in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. I'd gone over there. I'd had a great time. I'd visited some hospitals, and we'd found a property to establish a place. After about two weeks, I was sitting on this airplane feeling really proud of myself and content. I let my guard down. I was looking out the window and I saw this massive, powerful engine of this airplane. And I thought to myself, how smart and intelligent we are as human beings that we can fly. 
within a millisecond, God spoke to me. And you know it's God because it happens so fast. You think about a million things all in like a second. And my mind is not that fast. And so what happened is God said, no, man flies because he obeys God. You think about it at the moment. Immediately God took me back to my physics class where I learn about low pressure systems. And so what an aeroplane does, all an aeroplane does, is it goes through the air and the flaps create a low pressure system and a physical object is lifted and sucked into a low-pressure system. It's a, I know it's a bit more advanced than that. But essentially, that's what it is. So all of us, who thousands of us that are sitting there, arrogantly shaking our fist of God, sitting on an aeroplane, what's hilarious is by faith, we don't see air pressure, but by faith, we believe in it, and we obey it, and a massive blessing happens. Again, uh, we can build a building and you can have the most intelligent engineer and you can have the Lord Mayor himself and they can come along and we can look at the posts and they can, with all their power and intelligence, and say, well, I feel like, I feel like that's vertical or I think that's vertical or I want that to be vertical. No, every person on that work site, no matter how powerful or intelligent or experienced they are, they submit to the bubble on a spirit level. They totally submit. No one of any position of power in the universe will do anything apart from submitting to the bubble on the spirit level because that's faith. They don't see it. They don't know why. But millions of people all over the world are building blessings from God in the form of glorious structures because they, in faith, obey this invisible thing called gravity and they submit to this bubble They think it's a bubble, but it's really God's law. And essentially, non-Christians everywhere are obeying God and actually walking in faith because none of these laws are physical. So again, I am obeying God by even bothering to flex my muscles and expect in faith, I obey, I expect that air will come in. And so uh, when we think about why even open your eyes, we have, I have faith I don't know where it comes from, but I have faith that if I open my eyes right now and I obey that, I will see these things called light waves, visual images. I have faith that if I open my ear, I will hear. And so microwaves, uh, you know, electricity, they are all the foundations that God spoke and it says right here, even the invisible things. And we, in faith, believe them all day, every day, and we obey them, and God's blessing flows into the earth. Next, let's have a look at the promise of salvation. While Jesus is holding the universe together, (laughs) he wasn't kicking around in heaven, while Jesus is holding the universe together, he gets inside, um, what do you call it, a, a cell, and gets inside a woman's womb. Then he goes through this whole process in the form of Jesus, And he lives for 33 years, and he deals with the muck and the mess of humanity. What he is doing is he is physically carrying out the promise of the Father of providing a way of salvation so that we can actually go through an open heaven to to be with him in the kingdom of God once again. We are stuck in this earth. We are living in our own kingdom. And Jesus facilitated this process. He took on all of the sin and wickedness and perversion of the world on himself. He died. He was buried. And on the third day, he rose again. And then he came to life and he revealed himself to more than 500 people, plus the disciples. And Cephas and James is documented, ridiculously uh, documented, that he rose to life. And then he went to heaven and said, I've provided a way. The kingdom has come. Now, if you... Believe that I've provided a way. He's done it all. All we need to do is believe it. Just believe it. Guys, just believe it. And then what will happen if we believe that? Then when we pass away, like magnetism, our spirit will, with absolute confidence, go to eternity to be in the heavenly places with God. That is a promise that many of us here in this room have experienced and have the legal document confidence that that is our right that we now have, not earned, but we now have through our belief that Jesus provided that way. 
Faith is not some mystical thing. It's very concrete. It's very simple. Do you believe God's integrity? Do you believe God or don't you? And so, of course, um, the, the third one that we'll see, if we can go to the third one, is the promises for now. And what I'm talking about is mature believers. I'd assume that there's some people here that don't know the Lord or maybe have recently know the Lord, but the majority of you would be mature believers. What I want to say to us today is that now, through Christ, but actually through faith as well, through this gift of faith or this, uh, this mechanism called faith of us agreeing with God, he's released ridiculous blessings that are not retractable, they are consistent, that you will have a sound mind, that you can have his authority and, his, and access to his kingdom power, that you can know his, uh, words of no, his kingdom words of knowledge, that you can actually have all of these gifts that come from heaven now into this world. Now, the problem is a lot of us mature believers, sadly, we, we accept Jesus as Lord and we believe that when we die, we're going to go to heaven, but then we sit under the limitations our whole life of the natural world, of a natural dying world. It's a beautiful world, but it's dying, and there's limitations, and we, God has actually said that what I've given you is an open heaven now, back to what Adam and Eve had, similar, moving in that direction, where you can now access and not only have the beauty of the natural world, but draw down kingdom goodness, which has always been his intent for his people. And yet many of us sit and just limit ourselves by the natural world, when as his, as his people, he has said, now you have access to receive the promises that I have. Not only the promises that have been spoken in Scripture, that come to a believer that's actually moving in faith, a mature believer, uh, not only a sound mind and, and health and, and goodness and, and supernatural power and access to his authority, all of those things that we read about, but he's also given his thing, this thing called personal prayer. What I feel so discouraged about is that we have destroyed this word prayer. We might as well throw it out because it's so riddled with boring, apathetic yawnness that no one has any revelation. We need to get rid of that word because we've destroyed it and give it another word because it is the most exciting, beautiful, powerful thing that he's given us that we can sit and look up into an open heaven and see his face and say, God, would you give me a rhema now promise for this situation? And would you, God, send this to Ethiopia or Afghanistan? And, you know, there's a sense of, what a joy that we can rule and reign with him right now by saying, God, would you do this in Ethiopia? Would you do this in Afghanistan? Would you do this in Lismore right now? And we look at his face and we wait. And when we feel like he says yes, then our job is to say, I agree with you, God. Thank you. And then in faith, walk that into receiving those, those promises. I, I really hope that I've provoked you this morning, not only in, in demystifying this word faith and trying to make it a little bit more practical. I'm sure there's more to it. But it's really about, is God integrous? Do we believe God? If he spoke these promises in the word of God, do we believe it? God is, God is sitting there saying, I am just trying to give you this, all this amazing kingdom stuff. And, you, and all I've asked you to do is believe it. And you can't even believe it. And that's, that's such a, a challenge for us, isn't it? It's not that complicated. He's saying, do you really believe me? And if you believe, you really believe like Noah believed, then these things can come from heaven into our current situation. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you um, a story. I remember praying during the pandemic. We all prayed through the pandemic, didn't we? I had empty rooms and I had so many massive rooms that I could just pray in and and they're all mine. And I remember praying and I saw this vision. And this vision fits for these three categories. If you go to the next slide. I saw each member of the world with a Christmas tree in their house. And under that Christmas tree was hundreds and hundreds of presents under the tree. And that's the story of the generosity of God to every human being on the planet. There's all of these gifts that God gives and this non-Christian person, which is the first category, said, 
and, uh, and, le- and just has left them under the tree. Hasn't even bothered to receive them and has just left them on the tree and has ignored them. The second person has actually taken the presents to their bedroom and they've opened the first one and it's actually salvation where when they die they can go to heaven and they've kind of assumed, well, that's pretty awesome. Maybe they're all the same uh, and hasn't unwrapped the rest of them. They've got that one and they're excited that when they pass they're going to go to heaven through the open heaven into this beautiful place with God but they haven't opened the others. The mature believer, there was nothing under the tree Their bedroom was full of wrapping paper and they were just diligently assembling every promise and actually spending the time of every unwrapped promise to meditate on it and to believe it and to go through a process of saying, God, yes, you've given it to me, I receive it. It's it's a process of meditating on God, seeing his face and saying, have you promised me? You've promised me a sound mind. God, I want to see your face. I want to sound mine, God. I want to believe it. Help me to believe it. And to chew on that until you can believe and say, thank you, God. I receive that promise. And that's what the mature believer does with all of the gifts that God has given them. So faith is that we really believe, obey, and act upon God's promises so that... so as to receive his goodness. It's really not a lot he's asking us to do. His motivation, and it's my assumption, why don't you think about it? Do you think he created the world so that he could give all of his kingdom goodness to us? I think he did. I think that was his intent, to share everything with us. Not all right now, he's wise, and it's not good to give everybody everything right away, but there's this process that that is his intent in his own way. That's my assumption. And all he is asking us to do is believe him. (laughs) It's pretty simple. Now, I'm going to give you one example as I finish. So while we're down in Brisbane, uh, we're we're actually a little bit better financially than back in the day. But back in the day, uh, you talk about YWAM and you think no money, no nothing, and, you know, dirty old clothes. And that was the story uh, probably about 30 years ago. And we had a little team. We just bought a property and we had the money. Well, actually, took, we had a little bit of money. We took out a loan, got our property, and we were limited by our natural world in terms of our income. The only way that we made money was through our discipleship training school. No one really gave anything to us. We very rarely had any gift from any churches or anybody ever given to us. That was my experience for many years. So we had a, a, a payment system similar to many of you, where you run a school and you get an income. That income dictated to us that we could not do very much. We were limited by it. What we did was we had a vision, and our vision and our heart burden was that we wanted to preach the gospel in every country town in Queensland and New South Wales. We envisioned our hope before God is that we wanted to share the gospel and swarm throughout rural communities and take teams and preach the gospel and serve and bless people in every country town. But we didn't have a vehicle and we hardly had any money and we were locked into a system of the world that we couldn't do much about. What we did is we waited on God and we together as a team practiced looking up into an open heaven and with faith, we addressed God with faith and said, God, whatever you say, we're going to believe you. And so we looked at his face together as a little team and we said, God, would you provide a vehicle for us? And we felt there was an incredible confirmation that he was going to supernaturally provide a vehicle for us. We didn't know where it was going to come from or when or what to do. We didn't have any instruction at that time. But we were limited and we had a big vision of what we wanted to do. So what we did was we created an imaginary car park on our center. And for three months, anybody that walked across that car park got a clip behind the ear, a loving one. You can't walk across there. In faith, that is our new vehicle. We didn't know what it was going to look like, but we had made a car park for it in expectancy, in belief. That was our only response that we could offer God. We believe that you've spoken, God. We believe that we, in a rhyme away in our spirit, witness that you spoke in a personal way to our prayer. We made the car park. 
Now, we have cleaning every Monday morning where the whole base cleans everything around the place. So we thought, we're going to clean that van. So we assigned people on Monday mornings to get... They didn't cut any corners. They had to get a full bucket with detergent, with warm water, and they had to walk around and wash that bus. That's all we could do to demonstrate to God the intensity of our belief. You know what? Eventually, after three months, God spoke to me and said, I want you to go and approach this church. It's a church that we had no relationship with, and it's a church denomination that historically was not very favorable at all towards YWAM. I, totally cold, had an appointment. The minister that I was supposed to meet strangely left the week before, and a new minister who was from another denomination that wasn't burdened with the history of their relationship with YWAM, he met with me. I told him the story, and he said, oh, Have you ever thought of this kind of bus? What about a Toyota Coaster? And why don't we raise $20,000 for you? Now, back in 2000, no, I think it was 2003, that was a lot of money. And that was way out of our limited natural world capacity. So this church raised $20,000 and gave us this bus. And we were able to start this ministry. And I want to tell you that this year we sold it. We got it for nothing. We sold it for $5,000 after 20 years, and we did hundreds of thousands of kilometers all over Queensland and New South Wales, and I cannot even imagine. I feel like if I try to even guess how many country towns we went to minister, I'd probably, I might exaggerate, or I actually might be right on the money, because it was an, an unbelievable amount of ministry that that bus did, and it hardly ever, I don't think it ever broke down. We had a few maintenance issues. And that is God that when we, as mature believers, yes, we live in the natural world, but when it comes to church or kingdom ministry or whatever it might be, or even areas of healing and and praying for a sound mind and for joy and peace and these beautiful promises, God gives us this thing called prayer that we have ruined that word. Find your own word to redeem it and make it exciting because I tell you, it is exciting. There is nothing more exciting than standing in the midst of a powerful God who is overflowing with generosity and is already motivated to bless you and to actually put your request to him. And often all he's asking for you is to listen and if you feel like he says yes, to believe and receive. I hope that's encouraging. I'll leave it there. Um, Hallelujah, God is good. Oh, God, yeah. Father, we, um, we thank you, God, oh, so much for this exciting journey that you have for us as mature believers. Uh, Father, uh, how mind-blowing it is to be able to get in a room and look and see your smiling face. And it is smiling, God. You are not a frowning, angry God. You're a loving, kind God. And you have some criteria for your kingdom. And one of those is faith. I pray that you teach us, teach us to operate in this key. Teach us to operate in this key that would unload uh, your authority, your power for healing and ministry, but also for physical supernatural provision in our life, God. Father, we are tired of laboring for the kingdom in limited resources of the natural world. We need to operate so much faster And with so much more power, our personality, our charisma, our own ability is not enough. God, it's never been your intention. Your intention has always been to release your supernatural, your kingdom, your kingdom goodness uh, into our world. And Father, we choose to step out of the kingdom of man into the kingdom of God and say, God, Release your kingdom resources for your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Lovely to be with you. Yeah.